Welcome back to Module 7, the last module and the last chapter and the last video for this lecture series. In this short video, we are going to frame the discussion of how we look for intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. If we want to try to communicate with intelligent life, there's kind of two ways of going about that sending our own messages, and listening for others' messages. So I want to start out by talking about a couple of the messages that we have sent in the past. This first is on um, two spacecraft in the 1970s, Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. They had aluminum plaques attached to the outside of the spacecraft and then went on their way um, into our solar system. The idea is, even if it's tens of thousands or millions or even billions of years in the future, maybe some kind of intelligent life will find this, and it's kind of like sending a message in a bottle that they'll know that we exist and that we're out there. So all of these um, different aspects of this, uh, you can certainly research on your own if you're interested in finding out more about what each of these is trying to indicate. Um, but at the very bottom, for example, it shows our solar system, the sun, and not to scale, nine planets in the 1970s. We were, we were still counting Pluto. And the fact that this spacecraft came from the third rock from the sun. Another message that we've sent, um, we're on the Voyager um, 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft launched in 1977. The golden record was an actual record that could be played, and it contains images and audio. So in order for this to really be a message that some other civilization could listen to, they would have to know how to translate the record playing to create images and audio. But it's, it's something that it's more for humans than it is for any potential listeners. But it's neat because the golden record, you can go to the link at the bottom of the slide and find out what they basically put into this time capsule of Earth. So this quote here from Carl Sagan um, is interesting. The spacecraft will be encountered and the record played only if there are advanced spacefaring civilizations in interstellar space. And it really is a time capsule of what Earth was like in the 1970s. It contains greetings in over 50 different languages. It contains the sounds of everyday life on Earth. Dogs barking, car horns honking, people singing, and images of all the different cultures around the globe. And again, the link at the bottom of the slide here, you can go and explore those on your own and see what the committee at the time thought about what should go into this time capsule. Now, the other side of the coin, the search by listening for any potential messages, is devoted to the other side of that coin, and really trying to figure out how likely is it that there's intelligent life out there. So the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, SETI, is an organization put together to try to tackle this big question that humans have. And at the very first meeting of SETI, Frank Drake wrote an equation on the board, which has since been put up as a plaque here. And he wrote n equals, and then all of these different factors multiplied together. This is called Drake's equation, and its intention is to break down a question that is unanswerable. How likely is it that we are out there into factors that we can actually either directly measure or get a limited range of allowable values and get a number at the end that will tell us at least an estimate for that question. So the Drake equation helps us by breaking down the question of how likely is it that we are alone by figuring out how many communicable civilizations should exist in each galaxy. 
So I'm going to go top to bottom and describe these different factors and talk about the ranges and how we know these ranges. So the first one, R star, is the rate of star formation. How many new stars are forming every single year in the galaxy? Drake, back in 1961, his estimate was about 10. We have a much better understanding of the rate of star formation, and it really is six or seven stars per year. But if you want to be pessimistic, you really can't go below about four without completely disregarding real science observations. So there's a range here of reasonable numbers based on current knowledge. And so in each column, I give us the pessimist view and the optimist view based on our current understanding and not Drake's 1961 understanding. There's been a lot of science between now and then. The second line here is the fraction of stars with planets. Now Drake, back in 1961, he said about half. Half of stars should have planets, 0.5. A pessimistic view might be every one in four stars has planets, and our understanding from the Kepler mission, the fact that there are more planets than stars, suggests that that fraction should actually be all the way up to maybe even one, that on average every star has a planet. Now we know from our previous discussion that we need those planets to be habitable, and so the next step is how many planets are in the habitable zone in each star system. Drake's estimate back in 1961 was about two. A pessimistic view really can't go below one by that much because we know that Earth is in the sun's habitable zone. And a more optimistic view, including the knowledge that we have of what Kepler's statistics look like, would probably be still about two. Even as an optimistic view, we can't be unreasonable and bump that number up too high when we know what our current count of exoplanets looks like. Now, here is where we have these factors that were mentioned in the Fermi Paradox supplementary video and are things that we have to think about when we are pondering the likelihood of life. So, the fourth line is F subscript L or life. And that's the fraction of planets that are already known to be in the habitable zone. Each of these kind of builds on itself. The fraction of planets in the habitable zone that develop life of any kind. So we're talking about even just microbial life. Drake said, you know, if it's in the habitable zone, then it's inevitable. It will happen. And so he said one for that fraction back in 1961. A pessimistic view might put a limit on that, but we really can't say zero because, again, we exist here on Earth. An optimistic view takes the highest possible value for that fraction that every single planet in the habitable zone will form life of some kind. Okay, the next level down. F subscript I. That's the fraction of life systems that develop intelligence. So, this is a planet that is already known to be in the habitable zone when we're deciding this, and that has already developed microbial or bacterial life. What fraction of those go on to form intelligent life? Are there a bunch of filters that prevent that from happening whenever life exists? Drake thought so, and so his value was 0 0.01 for this fraction, that it's a 1% chance that we will actually have intelligence develop if we have enough time. That's kind of the pessimistic view too. And the optimistic view is that if you have microbial life and you give it enough time, it will form intelligent life. That's what happened on Earth. An optimist can take the high road on that. The next thing down, F subscript C. This is now assuming that this planet in the habitable zone that formed microbial life did develop intelligence, and now what we're trying to say is if we have intelligent life, what fraction of those intelligent life um, forms created the technology to send messages to distant stars, interstellar communication? Because that's still another um, limit. Humans existed on the surface of Earth for quite a long time using tools, but it is only in 
the last century or so that we have the way a way to send messages out. If we think about um, the phone and radios and the internet and our spacecraft, those are all relatively new technologies on the broad astronomical scale of life on Earth. So Drake takes the pessimist view here, um, but an optimist would say, again, given enough time, intelligent life will be able to come up with those technologies. And then this last one here, the average lifetime of civilization's communication abilities. There's a lot of unknowns in that one. Even now, we are trying to figure out how our unstable civilization here on Earth is going to be able to handle the upcoming filters and upcoming obstacles that it has to overcome. Now, Drake took a optimistic view here that from when a civilization first develops the technology to send messages to space to when they either destroy themselves or are destroyed by natural processes would be about 10,000 years. The pessimistic view is that that technology only lasts so long, 100 years. And the really important thing that I want us to understand from this slide is that, okay, so Drake came up with the value of 10, but that's on old information. I want to talk about the pessimist and optimist views here. The pessimist has taken the low number on everything that they can, and they get that there's a one in 10,000 chance that there will be a communicable civilization in a galaxy. But what that means is with 10,000 galaxies, every 10,000 galaxies has intelligent life. That number still points to the fact that there are intelligent civilizations out there. They are just too far away for us to ever find them. The optimistic view, on the other hand, suggests that there might be hundreds of thousands or over a hundred thousand communicable civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy alone. Now that's a hundred thousand out of hundreds of billions of stars. It would still be hard to find them if they exist, but it gives us a sense that maybe there really are other civilizations out there that are also sending their own messages and listening for messages, and maybe we'll be able to find a trace of their former existence, or they'll hear us in the far future as well. Jill Tarter gave a fabulous TED Talk back in 2009. The link is here in the slides. Um, I won't be able to put it into YouTube, I think, but it's 20 minutes and it's one of my favorite TED Talks. It covers a lot of the things that I've only briefly touched on in this particular video. Now, the very last slide of the semester is this picture here. This was taken by the Voyager spacecraft, the ones that launched back in 1977 with the golden record on board. And it's looking back at the Earth from the far reaches of the solar system out by Uranus and Neptune, looking back and basically taking a picture of where they came from. The Voyager spacecraft are currently still the farthest human-made object to exist away from Earth. And it gives us a little bit of perspective. I hope over the course of this semester, one of the biggest goals besides building critical thinking is to get a little more perspective on how tenuous life is here on Earth, and all of the wonders that exist once we leave Earth's surface. So I will leave you with this quote here on the slide, and the link to the video will be the next one in the playlist where Carl Sagan will read these words to you in his own voice. And I am thankful for all of your attention this semester, and I hope that you've enjoyed the ride. Thank you.